So let me begin again. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Carew. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Science here at NYU. And on behalf of that faculty and the entire NYU community, let me welcome you tonight to an extraordinary discussion. Um, I want to, at the outset, thank the discussants and thank the uh, lecturers tonight. I want to thank all the colleagues around the room I see from NYU, and especially thank our guests who have come from near or far to, to engage in this discussion. Let me also personally thank all the, the organizers who made this happen, but especially a, a, a special thanks to Jean-Philippe Dedeux, who is the Cirrus Fellow and Visiting Fellow in the Social Department of Social and Cultural Analysis in the Faculty of Arts and Science, <clears throat> and also to Stefan Montanari, who I understand cannot make it, but nonetheless, I want to thank him. He is the head of the Com Communications Unit in the Office of the Commissioner of Human Rights for the Council of Europe. We, Europe. We, we truly appreciate their efforts and their, and their insight and wisdom in crafting a discussion of, of such breadth and reach. Um, let me now turn to this evening's topic very briefly. Uh, there are those at the podium who are more educated than I by far. But when I thought about tonight, uh, earlier today, and, and what it meant, um, I appreciated that, that around the, the world there are, in fact, uh, nations that celebrate their national heritage, uh, their unique political systems, their diverse cultural and religious traditions, their national literature, their music, their cuisine. By virtue of these extraordinary differences, they also face significant challenges. Few, if any, nations are spared the daunting challenge of, of assuring that all citizens within that national community are treated with equal fairness and dignity, are afforded the same rights, and are felt to be genuine and fully participating members of that national community. This is especially challenging for those who are not born into that national community, but those who have immigrated into it. For all citizens in all national communities, both those born into those cultures and those immigrating into it, the essential value of human rights at all levels of national interaction is a critical, absolutely critical, uh, uh, important dimension to the governance of these countries. And that is the deep theme of, of our conference tonight. Now, of course, the discussion tonight has got a huge global reach. It's of global impact, and it's for that reason that I'm delighted that we're doing it here at NYU. The topics that we'll consider have uh, reached well beyond nations. They span oceans. And NYU takes great pride in being a genuine global network university. We have three um, portal campuses that are degree-granting campuses, NYU New York, NYU Shanghai, and NYU Abu Dhabi. We also have 11 global uh, uh, academic centers around the world, from Prague uh, to Buenos Aires to Ghana, where our students and our faculty explore their scholarly pursuits in an environment that sharply uh, allows them to focus on their work in that in, informed by the environment within which they're working. Indeed, one of the important considerations for a student at NYU, chat one up on the park when you leave, when he or she is considering their next semester of study is not only what course they want to take, not only what research they want to do, but they have to decide what continent they want to be on to, to engage in those scholarly pursuits. So, so we truly are a, a global place. And because of that, the conference here is, is fitting. And in fact, I would go beyond fitting to say we, it's ideally suited for the platform for the discussion tonight, because the critical issues have such global reach. So let me end as I began by warmly welcoming all of you to this pivotal evening, a seminal, extremely timely discussion. And now let me turn the podium over to Jean-Philippe, who will introduce this evening's events. Jean-Philippe. Thank you very much for this introduction, Dean Tom Caru. I'm truly delighted that this event is taking place. It started four months ago as a Twitter conversation with Stefano Montanari, head of the communication unit of the commissioner, why we, were un why we were witnessing the unfolding of the refugee crisis in Europe. Unfortunately, Stefano cannot be with us tonight, but I want to acknowledge his contribution for the event would not have taken place without him. I also want to thank all the institutions that have supported this event. The conference is co-sponsored by the Council of Europe, NYU Center for International 
Research in the Humanities and Social Sciences, Office of the Vice Provost for Faculty, Arts, Humanities and Diversity, the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, and finally, Harvard University's FXB Center for Health and Human Rights. Before giving the floor to our distinguished guests, I would like to share with you a few facts that have led Stefano and me to organize this event. This conference takes place at a defining moment for our democracies. All of us have in mind the images of dead bodies floating on the shores of the Mediterranean <coughs> Sea and or left stranded in the Arizona desert. According to UNHSR, 2014 saw the highest displacement since the post-World War II era. More than 60 million people worldwide were forcibly displaced as a result of persecution, conflicts, or human rights violations. Children under 18 years of age constituted 50% of the refugee population in 2014, the highest figure in more than a decade. Finally, based on the data compiled by the International Organization for Migration, more than 5,000 people died last year trying to reach safer shores. The dramatic crisis in Europe brought on by asylum seekers from the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, but also the plight of refugees from Central and Latin America in the United States have all been met with a combination of repressive measures, walls and fences, across borders, launching of naval military operations in the Mediterranean that happens to be one of the most murderous and deadly seas for migrants, laws criminalizing undocumented migrants, and finally, populist and xenophobic parties in Europe and in the United States of America that have fueled racist resentment towards Muslims and migrants and have encouraged hate speech and crime. At the same time, the United States of America and Europe are increasingly engaged in counterterrorism operations in a way that strains the democratic fabric of our society. Some of these measures have a disproportionate impact, as you know, on ethnic and religious minorities that further polarize our societies. Governments and policymakers claiming the incompatibility of security with human rights protection are adopting laws and policies which increase the power of security services with, without guaranteeing the checks and balances necessary in a democracy. Ultimately, such policies contribute to the erosion of democratic values on both sides of the Atlantic. Are these trends compatible with Western countries, democratic values and histories? Why have governments and the EU done so little in terms of preparedness in spite of the repeating, the repeated warnings and numerous reports from international organizations and NGOs? How do the xenophobic attacks against migrants relate to this broader and this sole policy context? Why is the United States unable to adopt a more human policy on the border with Mexico while spending billions of dollars on fences and technology to control the border? Governments keep trying, keep repeating that we have to sacrifice rights to ensure security. Should we try to strike a balance or is this simply a false opposition? To answer this question, we have tonight a distinguished panel of scholars, activists, and public figures that have accepted very kindly to share with us their experience, their thoughts, and following the two guest lectures to engage in a debate. <coughs> As you can see on the program, the debate, this debate, was supposed to be moderated by Ahmed Shihab Eldin from Vice Media. Unfortunately, Ahmed has been called to cover the current crisis in Israel, but we are lucky to have with us tonight Aliona Minkowski, who is host and producer at HuffPost Live, and whom I thank very warmly for stepping at such short notice. So following Dean Karu, I would like to extend once again a very warm welcome to our guest tonight, and with no further ado, 
give the floor to Nils Musnex, Commissioner for Human Rights at the Council of Europe, and then Susan Ehrman, President of the American Civil Liberty Union. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. I work for the Council of Europe. When I studied political science in the United States, I never heard of the Council of Europe. Not in my undergraduate years, not in my graduate years. Uh, never came across my radar screen. And I'm unsure whether that reflects the lack of importance of the Council of Europe at the time I was studying it, uh, or the quality of my education. I didn't, of course, go to NYU. Uh, but <clears throat> it could be that my education predates uh, the mid-90s when the Council of Europe got a new lease on life with the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the fall of communism, and, and uh, kind of uh, uh, reforms in, in Eastern Europe. Many people confuse the Council of Europe and the European Union. The Council of Europe is a much broader uh, organization geographically. It has 47 member states, all of the 28 EU member states, plus such very interesting countries as Russia, Turkey, Ukraine, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, countries next to Yugoslavia, Norway, Monaco, Switzerland. Uh, so it's much bigger. Uh, if the EU uh, is known for its common market, its common currency, and until recently, freedom of movement, uh, the Council of Europe likes to see itself as a guardian of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. And I often say that the EU is rich in resources, but the Council of Europe's big wealth is in human rights standards. That is where we are really rich. Uh, let me briefly sketch in uh, the landscape of the Council of Europe and situate my own work on it before turning to uh, the topics uh, uh, mentioned uh, early on. The center of the, of the Council of Europe is the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which I think for many people in America is incomprehensible because it's a transnational court that passes judgments on a daily basis and member states implement those judgments by changing their laws or paying compensation to people on a daily basis. It works imperfectly. Compliance is not as good as it could be, uh, but it is one of the strongest regional mechanisms, uh, I think, in the world. Uh, if the court is a judiciary, we have an executive uh, as well, the Committee of Ministers, 47 ambassadors, a secretariat of 2,000 people, a lot of monitoring mechanisms, uh, and there's a legislative, the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, composed of deputies, and there's my office. Uh, my office was created in 1999 uh, to be an independent, impartial, non-judicial institution to help member states improve their human rights record. Uh, what does it mean, independent? Uh, I'm supposed to not take any instructions from anybody outside the House, inside the House. I have a six-year non-renewable mandate. I cannot be uh, re-elected, uh, <laughs> since it means I don't have to start lobbying to be re-elected halfway through my mandate. I have my own team of 25 people. Uh, a budget of 3 million euros a year, uh, and I determine my own priorities. Uh, and two of them lately have been migration and counterterrorism. Um, impartial means I'm supposed to treat all member states on equal basis, whether it be Monaco and Russia, or Azerbaijan and Norway. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm supposed to use the same standard. It's not easy, uh, but that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, Non-judicial means I cannot force anybody to do anything. I have to persuade them. I have to shame them. I have to raise awareness. Uh, I have to show them good practices. I have to provide political and legal ammunition to those who want to do the right thing. Uh, I do have one legal power. I can intervene before the European Court of Human Rights as a third party, and I'm doing this uh, increasingly, uh, and I have a couple of cases on migration where I will intervene very shortly. Uh, the core of my work is country visits. Uh, I identify two or three topics, uh, and then I go to a country and I meet everybody who's anybody, starting with NGOs, uh, ministers, parliamentarians, ombudsmen, uh, and I go uh, on site visits. Uh, site visits means I see the dark underbelly of Europe. I go to refugee squats, I go to psychiatric institutions, I go to police stations, <clears throat> I go uh, to battered women's shelters, I go to migrant detention facilities, um, you name it, I've, if it's a nasty place in Europe, I think I've been there. Um, what do I do? I write reports with recommendations, and then I follow up uh, with the media uh, in, in meetings with politicians, with letters, and so on. 95% of my work is public, uh, and 5% is behind the scenes. Um, I've done country visits with reports to 29 countries in Europe. Uh, some I've visited many times, Ukraine, 
five times in the last year and a half. Um, and the two issues I've dealt most often in recent months are migration um, and uh, upholding human rights while combating terrorism. Um, now, I've done migration-related work in about 15 countries over the last three years. And I found a, a hidden Europe, a Europe that you don't usually read about, uh, where there are tens of thousands of migrants, uh, even before this recent influx, uh, squatting in abandoned buildings in Rome uh, or in The Hague, living in parks in Athens, uh, on the streets in Paris or Istanbul. Uh, I even met Syrian refugees living in huts and tents in Serbian forests two years ago. So this is nothing that new that we're seeing now. Uh, many of the shortcomings and gaps in the legal framework dealing with, with migration and, and, and refugees were very evident uh, already several years ago. Uh, but it's become much worse over the last uh, few months. Spain recently adopted legislation uh, to enable border guards to push back migrants arriving uh, from Morocco without due process, uh, and this despite an international outcry. Uh, in Hungary, the government not only has built a fence, uh, there are a lot of fences in Europe, but it organized a racist campaign aimed at the population to immunize them against compassion, uh, linking migrants with crime, uh, and basically fomenting uh, prejudices. Uh, fences we've seen in, in many places, and they're going up uh, daily in Europe. Uh, and it's quite, uh, it's quite interesting to watch, because you see how, how the migrants adapt to the fences, and they find a way around uh, or over. As Salil Shetty, the head of Amnesty, put it, if you build a 20-foot fence, a migrant, a desperate migrant will find a 30-foot ladder, and they have done so. Um, in Denmark, a right-wing populist party holds the balance of power. Uh, they just cut benefits ostensibly to reduce the pull factor. Uh, <clears throat> and they not only that, but they took out ads in Lebanon to try to persuade migrants to stay away. Uh, in, uh, with the larger influx in August and September, uh, we've seen a lot of uh, pretty amazing uh, statements coming out from political leaders in Europe. Uh, several European governments have come out saying, we only want Christians, no Muslims. Uh, but the Cypriot foreign minister uh, trumped everybody by saying, we want Christians, but we would really prefer Orthodox Christians. We don't want Muslims. Uh, <clears throat> so it's quite uh, shocking, actually. Um, when the European Union tried to impose mandatory quotas or, or organize mandatory quotas, you had a, quite a hysterical response from a number of, of East European governments, including uh, the Latvian government, but also uh, the Slovak government and others. Uh, they've never seen a Syrian refugee, but they're petrified of them and they don't want them. Um, what has been, uh, this is all very disturbing uh, since so few countries have done uh, anything significant to receive refugees. Uh, Turkey has done more than uh, anybody else has more than 2 million refugees. Uh, the others, Germany, Sweden, Austria, uh, have also been quite welp welcoming, but the response of most European governments has been uh, pretty shameful. Uh, not even thousands of deaths in the Mediterranean uh, made European governments shift position, uh, and there's a big temptation to externalize a problem uh, beyond Europe's borders. Uh, what we're seeing now, actually, is Europe trying to buy off Turkey to keep people from flowing further. I don't know how they how this is going to work. Uh, <clears throat> they just gave 3 billion euros to Turkey to try to stem the flow of people into Europe. Uh, how they're going to do this without physically stopping people uh, when they get on boats uh, in the Mediterranean, I don't, I don't imagine how they can do it, and without detaining them uh, for lengthy periods of time. So uh, I think it's a, a, a pretty odd approach. Um, the second big area where we've had a lot of uh, backsliding is upholding human rights in the struggle uh, against terrorism. Uh, we've seen many violations recently in Europe. Uh, the existing safeguards have proven to be very ineffective. Uh, and here, the US is directly implicated in what's going on in Europe. And to address it effectively, we need cooperation uh, across the Atlantic. And it's not really taking place yet. Uh, democratic oversight has turned out to be uh, largely a fiction, a democratic oversight of security services. In my mind, there are two big episodes that show that the overseers have not done their jobs at all. 
Uh, the first was the revelations about extraordinary rendition 10 years ago, <coughs> abductions, uh, torture, uh, uh, moving people uh, to Guantanamo and elsewhere with a complicity of about 25 European governments. Where were the people overseeing the security services? Why didn't they raise their voices? Uh, and the second big episode, uh, in my mind, that shows that oversight is ineffective um, were the revelations of mass surveillance. Where were the overseers? Were they aware that this was going on? Were they not aware? Were they not capable of, of, of following and monitoring what was going on? Why didn't they say anything? Why is uh, oversight so ineffective? Um, regarding the CIA rendition program, if you recall between 2002 and 2006, uh, the CIA, in cooperation with many governments uh, in Europe, uh, carried out this, this program uh, and uh, several judgments of the European Court of Human Rights have now been passed down from the victims uh, from, uh, of, of extraordinary rendition in both the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and Poland. Uh, the plaintiffs in the Polish case, uh, men by the name of Al Nashiri and Abu uh, Zabudaya, uh, are now in Guantanamo. Uh, the court <coughs> found Poland to be in violation of its obligations under the European <coughs> Convention. Uh, <coughs> that there was no effective investigation of what had gone on. It also condemned Poland's refusal to submit evidence uh, to the court, and it required Poland to obtain assurances from the US that al Nashiri would not be subject to the death penalty. Um, the significance of this and similar judgments goes well beyond these individual cases. Uh, at least 25 European countries have been complicit, and there's been almost no accountability in Europe for these crimes. Only in Italy uh, is there some sort of accountability. There were some investigations and some people were punished. Uh, mass surveillance. It might seem like a minor issue compared to torture, uh, compared to abductions, compared to uh, unlawful detentions. Uh, but it can not only destroy the rights to our private lives, it can be abused to the detriment of media freedoms. Um, what happens to the confidentiality of journalistic sources if you're being monitored by the security services? Uh, it can undermine the right to a fair trial. What happens to lawyer-client uh, confidentiality? It can undermine freedom of assembly, freedom of association, and other rights as well. Uh, and what we've seen in the last few months is that several European governments have been amending laws to increase the powers of the security services uh, to snoop on us. Uh, very recently, Switzerland adopted a new intelligence, uh, intelligence law uh, widening the powers of the security services. In June, uh, France adopted a much criticized law uh, and is now discussing a proposal on surveillance uh, of international electronic communications. Uh, similar laws have been adopted in the UK, in Spain, in Turkey. So you think that something would have been learned from the Snowden revelations, but we're going in the opposite direction. We're actually giving more powers to security services. Um, how can we respond to these challenges uh, in a human rights compliant way? Uh, my job is to help governments try to find answers in line with human rights. Um, and I've tried to highlight some concrete steps that can be taken uh, to reconcile uh, human rights protections and security, including border security. Um, regarding migration, I think there's an urgent need to reform uh, legislation and policy on asylum in Europe, uh, starting with the Dublin return system. Those, this might be a bit arcane for people in America, but there's a system whereby you're supposed to, uh, the first point of entry is a country that's supposed to examine an asylum claim, and other countries in Europe uh, can send back the person uh, to uh, the first point of entry. What this does is it puts unsustainable pressures on certain frontline countries like Greece, like Italy, like Malta. Uh, uh, and the system is now uh, collapsing, and it needs to be uh, reformed. Uh, there's a need for relocation from frontline states based on solidarity. Uh, there's a need for resettlement of Syrians and others uh, from areas uh, in and around Syria, like Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey. I've met a lot of Syrian refugees in Germany and elsewhere who showed me pictures of their families on a boat uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea after they had paid several thousand euros for the voyage. All Syrians in Europe get refugee status or subsidiary protection. We 
everybody acknowledges they need protection, but we force them to take these dangerous routes to pay thousands of euros uh, to smugglers. Uh, why not re resettle them directly uh, from areas in and around Syria and other hot spots? Um, when relocating or resettling people uh, in Europe, we will have secondary movements unless we take into account family ties um, and harmonize further reception standards. Uh, this means that the EU should give money uh, to states with little or no experience in refugee integration, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. We need more legal venues for people to come so they don't, uh, so they don't <coughs> have to take these dangerous uh, routes by land and by sea. We need humanitarian visas, family reunification, uh, short and long-term work permits uh, for people. And we need to boost search and rescue efforts uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we cannot expect Italy to do all the heavy lifting alone and save people uh, in the Mediterranean. Um, of course, we also need to boost integration efforts, access to the labor market, uh, to microcredits, language training, and so on. This is the next phase. And now everybody's in panic about how to deal with the emergency needs for, for housing, food, uh, but we have to think, we have to begin thinking long term as well. Uh, regarding counterterrorism, uh, these judgments on extraordinary rendition uh, should drive all European governments to lift the veil of secrecy uh, over the past human rights violations. Uh, I kind of doubt it will, but it's a tool that we can use uh, in Europe and elsewhere, but we need uh, American cooperation as well, uh, and right now it's not forthcoming. Uh, <clears throat> the lesson is that states should not use a state secret privilege to hamper judicial and parliamentary initiatives uh, to determine responsibility. Uh, for unlawful acts, uh, and that forfeiting human rights in the fight against terrorism is a grave mistake. Uh, it's also ineffective. It breeds contempt for the rule of law and feeds into the cause of terrorism. Uh, regarding surveillance, we need to re-inject human rights into the debate. Uh, the laws should be clear and precise as to the offenses, activities, uh, and people subject to surveillance. We need <coughs> strict rules on duration, retention, and destruction of data. Uh, and we need independent scrutiny and robust judicial oversight. Uh, right now, we're going in the opposite direction, uh, but I think we have to keep, uh, we have to keep up these efforts and, and bring surveillance back into the framework of the rule of law. Uh, so to conclude, I would argue that in meeting the challenges of migration and terrorism, we cannot betray our own values. Uh, we cannot throw out our human rights obligations. Uh, and there's no contradiction between national security and human rights. So they go hand in hand. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Good evening. Um, being from the United States, uh, my beat has been American law, but I just want to start because you know, following up on what Nils was just talking about, I had a brief glimpse of how these issues look to Europeans. I want to follow up mostly on what Jean-Philippe and Nils were talking about, about mass surveillance and the connection with democracy, which is sort of the theme for tonight. So in March, I was at the Brussels Forum. Where, I don't know if you were there, Nils, but it was very interesting to me because one of the panel that I was on was about mass surveillance and counterterrorism. And it was a very technological conference. Everybody in the audience had clickers and were programs that could all vote on things. So they kept polling the audience, you know, that you're very interactive, which we're not being tonight especially. But everybody was asked, so would you like to see government have more surveillance powers or are you concerned about you know, civil liberties? And what was interesting was this conference was taking place very shortly after the attack on Charlie Hebdo. And most of the Europeans were all for more surveillance. Um, very, you know, I was somewhat unpopular trying to tell them about the experience in the United States and how we've become more concerned about the mass surveillance power. But as Nils was saying, most of the people in the audience, the Europeans, were not open to learning from the American experience, and they believed that mass surveillance was going to keep them safe. Um, it was somewhat frustrating to see this. The only people in the audience, you know, this is a very uh, pronounced pattern. The people in the audience who got it, who did not want more surveillance, were the Germans. Okay? The Stasi. Right? They knew. You know, they understood what the other side was. 
So it seems to me, uh, you know, I very much agree with Niels, Niels's program of what we should be doing about mass surveillance and why, but it seems to me that the major, major uh, stumbling block to um, the reason that we're not doing that is that it's this question that I get all the time. Why should I care what the government knows about me if I'm not doing anything wrong? Okay, so that's the problem. Maybe people feel like surveillance is all benefits and no cost. We're going to you know, keep ourselves safe. We're going to find out everything the terrorists are doing. It'll keep us safe. And there's really no cost because why should I care if I'm not doing anything wrong what the government knows about me? Now, there's a whole other story, of course, that we could tell about why the expectation that surveillance would keep us safe is really not true. But what I want to get into tonight is the other side of the story, the costs of surveillance in terms of not only rights, as Nils was saying, but in terms of democracy itself. So I wrote a book, which is about the impact of post 9-11 changes in law on ordinary Americans. And surveillance is one of the things I talk about in the book, if you want to know the others, you know, amazon.com. Uh, but what happened after 9-11 on the surveillance front was that the United States almost immediately, five or six weeks after the attack, started supersizing our surveillance powers. The Patriot Act, or if you didn't know it's an acronym, there it is, right? You know, that's a lot of, you know, <laughs> a lot of self-confidence, a lot of swagger that we already knew five weeks after 9-11 exactly what tools were required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. But in addition to the Patriot Act, which was a change of law, we also now know, and we actually knew um, way before Edward Snowden even, that the uh, administration had been doing things that were not uh, authorized by the law, and in fact were against the law secretly, empowering the National Security Agency to collect information about uh, Americans. And this is the New York story, you know, Times story that uh, way before Edward Snowden leaked that this was something that was happening. Uh, if I have a theme tonight, I think this wonderful quote from Elaine Scarry is really about the connection between the Patriot Act and mass surveillance and democracy. So if you can't see it from where you are, what Scarry says is that the Patriot Act inverts the constitutional requirement that people's lives be private and the work of government officials be public. It instead crafts a set of conditions in which our inner lives become transparent and the workings of the government become opaque. Either one of these outcomes would imperil democracy. Together, they not only injure the country, but also cut off the avenues of repair. Okay, that's why she gets to teach English at Harvard. She puts so well, uh, you know, things that everybody else says. So what are the um, adverse consequences of mass surveillance? Well, a number, as Nils has already outlined some in terms of some of the dangers to rights. Uh, one of the major provisions of the Patriot Act, which allowed a whole lot of surveillance um, of custodians of people's records, came to be called the library provision. Because you remember the librarians shortly after 9-11? They were among the first people to start screaming. The Patriot Act gave the government the authority to go to anybody who holds any records on anybody, whether it's medical records, library records, internet records, you know, whatever kind of records they are, and get records uh, about people if it was considered that they might find something relevant about a terrorism investigation. It was a very low bar. And the librarians were the first to say, well, wait a minute. If the government can walk into the library and find out what people have been reading and find out what they've been doing on the computer in the library, isn't that really going to affect free speech, free thought, you know, people's academic research? Uh, so they were very concerned about the law. The Patriot Act went so far in terms of what Scarry says about cutting off the avenues of repair, that this provision that permitted the FBI to go into libraries and any place else and get information about their clients and customers also had a gag order, which prohibited the librarians or whoever received this order from ever telling anybody that they had received any request at all from the FBI. So when the librarians found out about this, this was shortly before Congress was about to consider whether or not to renew the provision of the Patriot Act in question. And the librarians were told that they were not allowed to testify in Congress about their own experiences of receiving an order because of that gag order. Okay, you know, that's, to me, that's a problem with democracy. It's not only rights. So there's a concern about free speech. Here's another person, in addition to the library connection people who I just showed you, those were the Connecticut librarians who became clients of the American Civil Liberties Union. And they followed in the footsteps of a person who I can now tell you, his name is Nick Merrill. He was known for six years as John Doe. He was an ACLU client. When he first came to the ACLU, he told the lawyers that he was an internet service provider. Very successful. 
Um, his clients included Ikea and Snapple and you know, all sorts of big places. And one day, the FBI comes to him with a demand for information about one of his customers. Well, he's never told anybody, because he's not allowed to, who the customer was. But he also was very concerned about this, because he had studied uh, the Constitution at Hampshire College. And he said, you know, how can this be that the FBI can just come request this information from me, and there's not even a court order? You know, that just doesn't seem right. So he went to the ACLU lawyers, and he said, now, if I challenge the government on this, is somebody going to put me in a sack and drag me away? And the lawyers said to him, well, we can't really tell you what's going to happen. Well, he decided to go ahead and bring the challenge anyway. And for six years, he litigated this case while, because of the gag order, he was not allowed to tell anybody that he was the person bringing this lawsuit. He was John Doe. He couldn't go to court and watch what was happening in the proceedings. When he went to talk to his lawyer, he had to lie to his girlfriend about where he was going. He had to hide the papers where she couldn't see them. So one of the consequences here was she broke up with him. She had a feeling that he was hiding something from her. So six years later, you know, finally, there was a little bit of a change in the law. And Nick is now allowed to say that he was the person who brought the lawsuit. There he is holding. He had this picture taken for my book, suit and all. Uh, and it's redacted because it doesn't have the name of the, the client who the FBI was looking for. So you know, think about how much does your internet service provider know about you? Right? If the government can just find out everything that you're doing, you know, that major you know, chilling effect on you know, what you're likely to do if the government can find out um, all your activities. So maybe I'll elaborate on that in a bit. Um, another example, I, I get Jean-Philippe was saying that this is not only a question about rights and about whether we're, we're having feeling uh, that our free expression and freedom of assembly and so forth is curtailed. The mass surveillance does not really fall equally on what the government is trying to find out about everybody. So one of the major things that happened, and this is something that most people in the United States don't know about, but you know, I've read that, in fact, people in the Middle East know a great deal about this. Starting in the fall of 2001, there was a major government campaign against the Muslim charities, the biggest charities in this country. And using all sorts of surveillance tools, some from the Patriot Act, some from other sources, the government did massive investigations of just all Muslim charities because they had this theory that perhaps money was traveling from mosques in Brooklyn to al-Qaeda terrorists in the Middle East. Now, by and large, that really just turned out not to be true. But the government did put many of the Muslim charities in this country out of business in terms of the European cooperation that Nils was talking about. The United States tried to get other countries to come down hard on various charities that the Americans were finding suspicious. And the Canadians and a lot of the Europeans would look at the evidence and just would not agree. So I think that in addition to all this massive surveillance, government investigations, having an impact on our freedoms, it also has an impact on the freedom of religion and on equality. Because a lot of the people who end up being targeted because the government finds out things about them, oh, you're giving to a charity? Well, you know, let's send an FBI agent to knock on your door and to find out why. You know, is there any chance that you know, this charity might be doing something? Why are you contributing? Uh, one of the things that the uh, ACLU researcher who did this report found out after interviewing hundreds of Muslims all around the country, was she found out that this campaign might well have been counterproductive, because there were a lot of Muslim Americans who were saying that they were loyal Americans, and they would have loved to help the FBI to figure out if there was any danger of terrorism in their communities. But they had come to see the FBI as enemies and were no longer willing to cooperate because they felt so targeted and so marginalized. So um, yeah, again, th this wasn't affecting public opinion very much. Most people in the United States didn't know about that. People thought the librarians were kind of quaint. Uh, you didn't really know much about the internet um, aspect of all this. So um, I think Edward Snowden has already been mentioned. But when Edward Snowden came on the scene and revealed you know, additional things, more than we had known about what the government was doing in terms of surveillance, that began to have an impact on public opinion. Um, do you know every, it, that Snowden recently went on to Twitter and he got a million followers in his first day? OK, you know, people really wanted to hear what he had to say. And I think he did have a major impact on what the public thought. So he was telling all sorts of you know, amazing things about these programs with names like PRISM and, and you know, all sorts of different names and how they worked and how the government was just scooping up all of this information. Thanks to cooperation from, you see at the top, all these uh, telecommunications companies like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, some of, they were sometimes ordered to turn over information, 
They sometimes just did so voluntarily because they were trying to be patriotic. The basic idea of the surveillance program is you'll get everything, right? You, know, you get all of the information, then if you ever want to find out, you track somebody's phone number, you'll have everything. And therefore, you will be able to connect the dots because you've collected all of the dots. So this is one of my favorite cartoons. If you can't see the caption, it says, get me everything on everybody. Um, here's another one. When President Obama became president, a lot of people assumed that all the Patriot Act stuff went away. Well, it didn't. And in fact, President Obama's positions on surveillance have been really very similar to those of President Bush's. And in some respects, he even expanded some of the surveillance programs that had begun under Bush, um, as we then found out. So um, one of the th things that became an issue was in terms of why do I care what the government knows about me? The mass surveillance that's being done is not of the contents of people's telephone conversations and emails and, and where you're surfing on the internet. A lot of that is being collected, but that's under a different program. And the scope of what's happening in terms of the contents of communications is not as broad. Where the scope is tremendous, where there really is bulk collection or has been bulk collection of on virtually everybody, get me everything on everybody, has been with what's called metadata. So because of peculiarities of the law under the Fourth Amendment, the part of the Constitution that governs what's a reasonable search or seizure, uh, the government started to collect all of the telephone numbers that people called and from which they were called. So what Snowden was disclosing was that Verizon and different companies were just being ordered to turn over all of the telephone records of all of their customers, you know, who they called, you know, what calls they got. So when that came out, one of the major things that the Obama administration argued was, well, what does that matter? What do you care if the government knows the phone numbers that you're calling? They're not even finding out all about you. They're just finding out the phone numbers you've called. Who cares? OK, can you think of any reason why you might care about that? OK, so there was this affidavit that was filed in an ACLU challenge to this program by uh, a computer professor at Princeton named Edward Felton, which you're, you're interested in this. It's a very interesting affidavit to read. And what he talks about is that actually metadata is much more revealing than the contents of conversations because it's structured, it's easier to search. And he has some examples of how if you know what telephone numbers somebody has called and from what telephone numbers they have received calls on the time of day and the duration, you can put together entire stories about people's lives. Okay, day, um, there's a young woman who calls the same number every night around 11 o'clock. Uh, one night she calls the number around 11 o'clock. The next day she calls her uh, telephone number that turns out to be her mother. And the, right about an hour after that, she calls up an abortion clinic. She never again calls the number that she'd been calling at 11 o'clock every night, which belongs to a young man. Okay, can you put together a story of what's happened there? Okay, have you called um, a drug abuse center or you know, have you uh, made a, a text donation to a, a splinter political group? Government can find out a tremendous amount, even just from metadata. So um, there's been one attempt that I know of to actually measure the chilling effect of all this. Because one of the theories is that if you know that the government is going to have right in their data banks that you have called a certain phone number, or that you have planned to travel to Yemen, or that you, you know, you've been visiting the mosque, or whatever it is, you might just not decide not to do it. So there's been one attempt that I know of to attempt to quantify what the chilling effect has been. And this was done by PEN America, the world's largest organization, I believe, of, that's of um, journalists, authors, writers. Um, Larry Sims knows about, a lot about PEN, which he, perhaps he'll tell you. But they did a survey of their members, all the authors, journalists, et cetera, and they asked, have you curtailed or avoided social media activities in light of your concern that the government may be watching and finding out what you're doing? You can see here 28% said they had curtailed their own activities. Another 12% said they were seriously considering doing so. That adds up to 40% who had changed their own behavior. 24% said they deliberately avoided certain topics in phone or email conversations. Another 9% had seriously considered it. 16% had avoided writing or speaking about a particular topic. Another 11% had seriously considered it. So you have all these people who are making choices about what they're going to talk about, what they're going to research. Are you afraid to go to the library and check out the book on Osama bin Laden? Are you going to start researching on the internet how hydrogen bombs work? 
can a student you know, start you know, doing research on the structure of dams? There was one student who was researching how dams are built and the FBI ended up at his door. So this was an attempt to measure the actual chilling effect, effect, which again, I think tells us a lot about the impact of surveillance on democracy. Penn then also tried to do a survey of um, international survey about the impact of mass surveillance on international writers. And this gives you, you know, some of the results there. I know you can't read all this, but if you want to know, you know what the results are, um, easy enough to find this online. So um, one other place where I uh, spoke, I guess, about a year ago, where people did not have the question, why should I care what the government knows about me if I'm not doing anything wrong, was the LA Community College, where they were having one of these, um, let's have the entire community read a book. And the book that they were all reading was 1984. You know, the students, the faculty, everyone else. So they invited me to talk because they wanted to think about, could that happen here? Is it happening here? Not a single one of them had the question of why should I care? Okay, not one. Um, however, instead of uh, telling you about Orwell, we all know about Orwell, here's a current example of a non-fictional country <coughs> moving rapidly toward dystopia. Have you read about this? This is a new program in China to give everybody in China a credit score. And the Chinese, the, the, the people who are monitoring all this, look at everything, social media, they just aggregate all the information that they can find out uh, about you, and they arrive at a credit score. On the right there, 698 is a sample credit score. So if you can read Chinese, which I can't, then you can see something about how that number is arrived at. But what this headline says on the bottom here is that they're including now not only things about financial transactions, but things about political activities. Okay, have you been involved in demonstrations? You know, what about, you know, have you gone to Tiananmen Square and you know, held a poster or something? So just everything about every, you know, people in China is now being absorbed by the government and they're creating this citizen rating score, which will really get to the whole question of not only what credit people get, that was where this started. If we have a complete credit rating on you and you have a number, people will know how to deal with you in financial transactions but it's now become a citizen rating score. And to me, this is exactly what Elaine Scarry was warning us about. The government has all the power. What they're doing is invisible, it's secret. What we're doing is totally transparent. And instead of the people controlling the government, the government is controlling the people. So just two more slides. So in light of the Edward Snowden revelation, Congress um, addressed something after it's called the USA Freedom Act. Another wonderful acronym, right? I actually met the guy who made that up one night over a beer. Uh, okay, so that was the USA Freedom Act, and what Congress was doing was they were considering whether to roll back some of this mass collection program by prohibiting the government from getting all this information. Uh, they did uh, roll this back to some extent, and I think the major reason for that was that after Edward Snowden's revelations, not only did public opinion change, but partially because public opinion changed, the private sector started objecting to all this massive collection. The telecommunications and internet companies that had been gung-ho to provide the government with information began to discover that mass surveillance was not good for business. Okay, some of their customers cared whether or not they turned over, you know, the companies turned over all of the information about them to the government. Um, there was also a problem with some other countries. There are countries in Europe and around the world that have data protection laws. And it turns out that there was talk after the Snowden revelations that if the American internet could not be trusted because it was porous and the government could see everything that everybody was doing, perhaps other countries would start their own infrastructure. We've had the infrastructure. So then Brazil would have its own internet and you know, wherever else in the world. So once Google and Facebook and Microsoft figured out that this was not good for business, there was a major sea change in their attitude. I have now spoken, uh, Microsoft hosted a panel on what's wrong with mass surveillance. You, if you read testimony now from Google and Facebook, they're all objecting. The government should let them tell people when the government asks for information. And they're all of a sudden the world's biggest privacy advocates. So there's been something of a change in the United States, but not that much. And as Nils is saying, I think that the, our lessons that we've been learning to some extent, I think not enough, have not really gotten around the world yet. And one of the major questions is what's going to happen now with the presidential election? If people don't think about this issue, then the candidates aren't going to be pressed. 
and we're going to end up, all these tools are lying around just waiting for the next president. President Obama, I think, trusts himself to have all this information because he believes and knows that he's not going to abuse it. Well, if somebody else is president, they're going to have all these tools. Um, what about the potential for abuse? So um, that's what I wanted to tell you about. Um, again, if you want to know any more about any of the information, you're welcome to go to ACLU.org. The ACLU has been trying for years to get some sort of accountability and oversight of the surveillance. We've been, you know, I, you know, it would take all night to list all the litigation we've been involved in. We've also, of course, been very much involved in attempts to get accountability for extraordinary rendition and torture. Um, I leave it to you to decide whether or not you're optimistic about whether any of that is going to succeed. Thank you. All right. Um, let's move on to the next portion here. Thank you, everyone, for your wonderful speeches. My name is Alona Minkowski, and again, thank you for having me. And uh, let me just say that, you know, to, to your last point that you were making there, Susan, are the candidates going to be pressed on these issues, I think that that's a question that comes up to journalists, and it's up to journalists, which I myself am, to make sure that politicians uh, are held accountable on issues like this, and so that's why it's so important that we foster this kind of conversation. Uh, but let me now introduce our next two speakers, Sally Engelmary. She's the Silver Professor of Anthropology and the Faculty Co-Director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice at New York University School of Law. And Larry Seams, he's a writer, human rights activist, and the editor of the Guantanamo Diary. So um, Sally, why don't you go first? Well, thank you very much. Um, we've had two really uh, exciting and important talks by Nils and Susan, and, and much to worry about. I, I'm going to begin to talk about the same issues from a slightly more positive point of view, which is to talk about what, in fact, a real commitment to a human rights approach could actually do to deal with some of these problems. And then I'm afraid I'll talk a little bit about why that might not work very well. So they have really articulated for us the crisis for democracy in Europe and the US posed by hostile and xenophobic responses to migration and the enhanced concern with security that this seems to have produced. Uh, and in many ways, the situation seems to be similar, and the linkage between these two problems, I would argue, is quite similar. They're driven in both cases by a resistance to change and difference, a fear of the other, and a loss of a sense of commitment to a collectivity and a collective responsibility for one another. So my question is, can a human rights framework provide a new way of thinking about the migration crisis and, to some extent, by implication, the concern with security? Potentially, a human rights approach has a great deal to offer. Human rights emphasizes inclusivity, that rights don't depend on your citizen status but are given to everybody by virtue of their humanity. There are political and legal rights in the system that are provided to all, not just those recognized by a state. So it's particularly valuable for people who are in the position of being undocumented migrants, people who are stateless, people who are migrants and living in a state other than that where they're a citizen. Moreover, according to human rights standards, every country is obligated to provide those who live there a minimal but adequate standard of living, including food, housing, health, and education either directly or at least by not establishing barriers to achieving these kinds of standards. Uh, it is true that in the human rights system this is seen as a progressive process, but nevertheless they are responsible for at least eliminating barriers to achieving these standards. Fourth, their provisions for migrants' rights in, explicitly in the human rights system, particularly in the Convention on the Rights of Migrant Workers, and for refugees in the Convention on Refugees and Stateless People. So these are already in place. And these conventions, as well as other parts of the human rights system, prohibit discrimination on the basis of race, gender, disability, and other criteria. So we have here a set of ideas and rules and a moral system that could actually deal effectively with some of the issues that we've just been talking about. And yet, as you all also probably know, the system doesn't necessarily work so effectively to deliver these rights. And one of the reasons why is the major problem of state sovereignty. And this is a great uh, obstacle in some ways to human rights achievement. 
nation states insist on and try to guard their sovereignty as much as possible. And the human rights system, in essence, challenges state sovereignty. It says, you, the state, cannot be trusted to do with your citizens and the people who live in your territory anything you want. There are limitations about what you can do to your people, and these limitations, which are set out in human rights conventions, are enforced by something called the international community, which, of course, is a vague and diffuse concept. The kinds of rights guaranteed by the Council of Europe system that Nils talks about are, in fact, more effectively ins insisted upon than what I'm talking about, which is a more global system. But countries resist this assault on their sovereignty, particularly in the area of controlling their borders, because this seems to be a very essential part of what state sovereignty means. So human rights mechanisms that protect migrants' rights have had, in fact, a particularly difficult time in the human rights system. The International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families, that's the title of this human rights convention, often called the Migrant Workers Convention, provides many protections for all migrant workers. It has all of the protection, the basic protections of civil and political rights that are in the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, and the basic protections of social, economic, and cultural rights in that convention as well. There's also part of this convention that has additional rights for legal migrants. The first part is covers all migrant workers. So this is a very promising document. However, it was actually the slowest convention to move from its state of being de developed by the general, UN General Assembly and coming into force. For a human rights treaty to come into force, there have to be at least 20 countries. They, they vary a little bit, but this one, 20 countries that ratified it. And it took 13 years before that happened for this treaty. It was passed and it was created and adopted by the General Assembly in 1990 and entered into force in 2003. Uh, it is now one of the least ratified conventions. It has only 48 states parties out of 192, 93 countries that are member states of the United Nations. Most human rights conventions have about 150 countries that have ratified it. And the only other one that has a similarly low rate of ratifications is the newest one on enforced disappearances, which already has 51 ratifications. Moreover, the countries that did ratify this convention are almost are entirely the countries that send migrants. Not one wealthy country that receives significant migrant labor populations has ratified it. So you can see it has a lot of potential, and yet it's been hard to deliver it. Uh, there is another convention for refugees and stateless people, which is actually more widely ratified, but it was developed in 1951 and dealt primarily with the European crisis and in 1967 was expanded to cover uh, a deeper time period and globally. So we have a promising set of ideas and laws which are not yet fully implemented. And it seems to me that we're now moving into a new era in the last few decades when capital moves easily and readily across borders while people don't. And as a result, we have created ongoing crises for some time now. We have large numbers of undocumented residents, uh, legal divisions between citizens and non-citizens who often receive sharply unequal treatment. Insofar as these situations of unequal treatment follow racial, ethnic, or religious lines, as they often do, they provide a fertile site for the emergence of ethnic tensions and conflicts, such as routine violence, ethnic cleansing, and even genocide. In a sense, by constructing these groups as being legally distinct, it fosters this notion of a fear of the other, of being actually distinct. And it also means that these state policies of exclusion and differentiation are connected to impunity on the part of the state, a failure in many ways to protect such populations from violence. So this state policy of leaving people in statuses of non-citizens, in fact, legitimizes violence and further exclusion. It also feeds a sense of fear and xenophobia, a concern about security, which then justifies further practices of division and exclusion. 
It fosters policies that maintain separation in the interest of security. So instead of trying to assimilate newcomers, they are viewed as separate and may be put in permanent refugee camps, which are thought of as temporary. But in fact, people in refugee camps are often not allowed to move into the wider society, not allowed to work. And we now see refugee camps where there are people who are even second and sometimes third generation, they have often been in existence for a long period of time. So this separation, again, furthers a sense of otherness and fear and concern about security. Fear and nativism, the exclusion of the different, is historically strongest where the population is least familiar with newcomer groups. We saw this in the US in the 1920s, the strongest anti Immigrant sentiment came from parts of the rural South, which was also engaged in developing the Ku Klux Klan and systematic lynching, and contributed to the development of the first racially exclusive immigration law in the US. There had been exclusion of Chinese immigrants in the 1880s, but in 1920, there was a race-based immigration law that favored Western and uh, Northern Europe and disfavored Eastern and Southern Europe. And this was generated in some parts by the, this isolated population's anxiety. And of course, as we've heard, the same thing is happening in Europe, in which places that are welcoming migrants are those where there's already a fairly diverse community, and those that are more homogeneous have been more resistant, Eastern Europe. There's even an interesting and important distinction between Eastern Germany and Western Germany, Western Germany having far more immigrants than the East, and most of the protests you hear about are taking place in the East. So there is a long-term and unfortunate legacy of this exclusion and rooted in past experiences. So differentiating among immigrants, holding them outside the rest of society, sets up a world of unequal, racially distinct populations, which is a recipe for hostility, anger, violence, and perhaps the creation of young jihadists. So what could an expansive and committed human rights approach offer? Inclusion, equality, a reluctance to establish differences that could produce discrimination, efforts to work toward guaranteeing a minimal standard of living and education for all, and finally, the expectation that all humans should be treated with dignity and respect. Obviously, we're a far cry from achieving these standards, but human rights provides a moral and legal ideal that if enacted by all countries, could in fact ease the current migrant and refugee crisis around the world and perhaps stem the growing and dangerous wave of racism, xenophobia, and preoccupation with security, which actually permits the kind of surveillance that we've just heard about. So this is an idealistic upside, and I um, think it suggests a way that we might think about moving forward to deal with some of these real threats to democracy that we now encounter. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And Larry, you're up. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, coming last is, or is next to last is hard. Um, these are huge topics, migration, surveillance. So I thought I would start by kind of turning the telescope around, going from the really general to the really particular, and then try to make five quick points or observations from there, which I promise you make sense in my mind anyway. Um, the first, the particular is a short passage from Mohamedou Slahi's Guantanamo diary. Slahi is still in Guantanamo. He wrote the book in 2005. Um, it's a memoir of what he called at the time his endless world tour of torture and, and detention. This scene takes place in February 2003. It's bef I'm sorry, February 2000. It's before 9-11. That's 15 years ago. Um, a couple, Mohamedou is himself a mig migrant. He grew up in Mauritania, got a scholarship to study in Germany, lived and worked in Germany as an engineer for 10 years, was unable to get permanent residency, so uh, relocated to Montreal, Canada, uh, and lived there for a short time. He was also a target of surveillance. When he got to Canada, he arrived just at this time, at the time where this guy named Ahmad Rassam tried to drive into the United States with a trunk load of explosives to blow up LAX as part of what was called the Millennium Plot. Mohamedou went to the same mosque as Rassam in Montreal, and immediately everybody in that community came under surveillance. And in the book, he describes this hilarious scene where the Canadian intelligence were actually boring holes in the, he and his roommates' apartments so they could just look through the walls at them. 
but he has enough of that, and he's on his way home in February of 2000. He flies from Montreal to uh, Brussels and then to Dakar, Senegal, which is the cheapest place to fly, and his brothers are going to pick him up there, drive him to Mauritania. When he lands, he's just this, this kind of group of, of Senegalese intelligence agents, grabs them, throws them in prison, and, he's, and it's at the request of the United States who want to interrogate him about the Millennium Plot. And they throw him in a cell, and he says, my concern, as I say, was and still is to convince the US government that I'm not a terrorist suspect. My only fellow detainee in the Senegalese jail had a different concern, to smuggle himself to Europe or America. We definitely had different Juliets. The young man from Ivory Coast was determined to leave Africa. I don't like Africa, he told me. Many of my friends have died. Everyone is very poor. I want to go to Europe or America. I tried twice. The first time I managed to sneak into Brazil when I, when I outsmarted the port, offic port officials, but one African guy betrayed us to the Brazilian authorities who put us in jail until they deported us back to Africa. Brazil is a very beautiful country with very beautiful women, he added. How can you say so? You were in jail the whole time, I interrupted him. Yes, but every once in a while the guards escorted us to look around, then took us back to jail. He smiled. You know, brother, the second time I almost made it to Ireland, he went on, but the ruthless, then they redact, whatever that is, kept me in the ship and made customs take me. Sounds Columbus-y, I thought. How did you get on board in the first place, I wondered. It's very easy, brother. I bribed some of the workers at the port. Those people smuggled me onto a ship heading to Europe or America. It didn't really matter. I hid in the container section for about a week until my provisions were gone. At that point, I came up and mingled with the crew. At first, they got very mad. The captain of the ship headed to Ireland was so mad he wanted to drown me. What an animal, I interrupted, but my friend kept going. But after some time, the crew accepted me, gave me food, and made me work. How did they catch you this time? My smugglers betrayed me. They said the ship was heading nonstop to Europe, but when we made a stop in Dakar and customs took me off the ship, and here I am. What's your next plan? I'm going to work, save some money, and try again. My fellow detain detainee was determined to leave Africa at any cost. Moreover, he was confident that one day he was going to put his feet in the promised land. Man, what you see on TV is not how real life looks in Europe, I said. No, he answered. My friends have been successfully smuggled into Europe. They have good lives, good-looking women, and lots of money. Africa is bad. You might as easily end up in jail in Europe. I don't care. Jail in Europe is good. Africa is bad. I figured the guy was completely blinded by the rich world that deliberately shows us poor Africans a paradise we cannot enter, though he had a point. In Mauritania, the majority of young people want to emigrate to Europe or the US. If the politics in African countries don't change radically for the better, we are going to experience a catastrophe that will affect the whole world. That was 15 years ago. Um, so uh, what happens to him next is, he talks about, he, he, he's, he experiences his first rendition. This is before 2001, even. The US sends a private plane with a French pilot. They send him back to Mauritania and then make the Mauritanians hold him in a, in a detention, in an intelligence prison in Mauritania. And he describes going through the airport. And he thinks it's really cool because they don't have to do all the customs checks and everything. They like zip them through. But he said, it was, it was a treat, but I didn't enjoy it. Everybody seemed to be prepared in the airport. In front, of us, in front of the group, the interrogator and the white guy, that's the American, kept flashing their badges, taking everybody with them. You could clearly tell that the country had no sovereignty. This was, coloni this was colonization in its ugliest face. In the so-called free world, the politicians preach things such as sponsoring democracy, freedom, peace, and human rights. What hypocrisy. Still, many people believe this propaganda garbage. One of the amazing things about what Mohammedu does in his book is he ex keeps exploring this idea of sovereignty or lack of sovereignty. Um, and it's such an amazing ground level look, kind of visceral revelation of, you know, as he moves through what really amounts to a kind of global archipelago of, of intelligence prisons that are orchestrated by the United States. You know, of course, people in countries like Africa have long questioned, you know, have big questions about US influence and about you know, local and national sovereignty as against that influence, um, and about the US's real commitment to supporting and building democracies. What's interesting about 9-11 is how not only is it a question for people in, in countries struggling to become democratic, but how the post-9-11 national security systems have kind of eroded and de degraded democracies uh, in the North as well. Um, Niels mentioned the interesting case in Poland. Um, 
where Abu Zubaydah and Abd al-Rahim al-Nashiri were renditioned to this secret uh, Polish prison. They landed on, in Poland uh, on December 4th, 2002. And when they stepped off of that airplane, hooded, shackled, onto this runway, they were setting foot in a country that had one of the newest constitutions in the world. It was, a, it was a nation that, in the moving words of that constitution's preamble, remains mindful of the bitter experiences of the times when fundamental freedoms and human rights were violated in our homeland. It was ratified in 1997, that's barely five years before that plane landed. And the constitution declares sim simply, no one may be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. The application of corporal punishment shall be prohibited. You know, the, the fact that we set up secret prisons anywhere on, air, on Earth just so we could pris put, put prisoners outside of the reach of our own laws uh, prohibiting torture is outrageous, of course. But there's something especially perverse about basing one of those facilities in a country whose bitter experiences include Nazism and 40 years of communist oppression. Uh, out of those experiences, the people of Poland created a state that embraced without reservation the absolute ban on torture and cruel and human, inhuman and degrading treatment. And the first thing that the United States did is to help degrade that state by setting up and running a secret torture chamber on their soil, something to think about. Um, Nils quite rightly mentioned the really important European Court of Human Rights decision. Um, and the work of that court is to be commended and the work of Polish prosecutors. Uh, it, it to be, is to be commended. It's also it's important to note the absolutely obstructionist role that the United States has played in those processes. Uh, six times the Polish prosecutors formally requested assistance under a mutual legal assistance agreement for information about what happened in those black sites, including simply the, uh, the complete version of the Senate Intelligence Committee's report that came out in December on CIA torture or what this, the, we only got the executive summary. Uh, six times the US refused to turn that over. We don't even have that whole report ourselves yet. Um, you know, and so you think about how secrecy uh, is used to uh, not only to uh, prevent accountability, but really to preserve the disappearance of the people. Um, it took four years and a court order for the Pentagon to release the names of the, just the names of the Guantanamo prisoners. We didn't even know until 2006 the names of the men who were there. It took seven years for Mohamedou's manuscript to get declassified. We only got it. I only got the manuscript in 2012. The Senate Intelligence Report that came out, we had been told that there were 99 people who were held in black sites. We found out when we got the Senate Intelligence Committee report that it was 119. 26 of them were people that the CIA admitted it had held by, held by mistake. These are some of the, the just very brief portraits of these people. One of them, Abu Hudaifa, who was subjected to ice water baths and 66 hours of standing sleep deprivation before the CIA discovered he was likely not the person he was believed to be. Nazir Ali, an, quote, intellectually challenged individual whose taped crying was used as leverage against his family members. Hayatullah Haqqani, whom the CIA determined, quote, may have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. We didn't even know these people existed until December 2014, 10 to 12 years after they had been kidnapped and disappeared. Uh, they surfaced only in footnotes. Think about how that inverts the whole paradigm of human rights, right, which are based on the recognition of individuals. And here they've been effectively erased from the records. How can you even build legal defenses unless you even know that who these people are? Um, second point, and the rest are briefer, I promise. Um, surveillance, I want to just mention briefly surveillance through the prism of this disregard for sovereignty and this kind of inver inversion or negation of the notion or recognition of individual rights. Snowden's leaks confirm a transnational surveillance system that's unbound by and often works deliberately to thwart national limits on domestic spying. We're getting, you know, we'll ask the Canadians to spy on Americans, the Canadians will ask us to spy on the Germans, you know, it's just this round robin thing. Um, I don't think it's so shocking that we were spying on Angela Merkel or Dilma Rousseff. I think that's like the business of statecraft and spy, spying. Everybody throughout history spies on the other leaders. What's shocking is that we're spying on every single citizen of every single country in the world. And when we talk about surveillance and reform in the United States and we 
do legal challenges for surveillance reforms in the United States. They only address the rights of Americans. There is no way for foreigners who are subjected to NSA surveillance to press claims uh, for their own for the invasion of their own privacy. And you have a two, so you have a two-tier recognition, even in our public conversation about surveillance. The rest of the world is the lives of the rest of the world apparently are an open book to us. Um, far beyond the particular and really important harms uh, that Susan mentioned, you know, it, we just learned this past week from the leaked documents that were published by the Intercept. You know, the, the drone program, which operates according to a paradigm of what they call find, fix, and finish. For find, that's when you use data, it's metadata and everything from signals intelligence, electronic digital surveillance. Uh, according to those documents, signals intelligence, that's digital surveillance, often from foreign partners, provides 57% of the information that goes into what they call baseball cards. Their baseball cards are like their list of people. You know, if you're on a baseball card, you're on a target list. 57% of, of that information comes from digital spying, largely orchestrated by the five eyes headed by the United States. Fix, that's when they find you and hold you and target you. Uh, sig signals intelligence in various forms continue to be a dominant form in fixing targets. They just track your cell phone. They know where you are. They're going to come and get you just locked on the beam of your cell phone. These things are only have only been controversial in the public discussion in the United States when they were um, when drones were used to assassinate an American citizen and his son, and in the UK when they uh, targeted and eliminated British citizens. Imagine just again look from the other end of the telescope. Imagine that you're in one of the countries where we're operating predator drones. How far away you must feel when you're looking up from any of the kinds of democratic protections and human rights that we're talking about. Um, absolutely no sense of s social contract, uh, consent of the government, or anything like that. Point three, you can just overlay a map of those countries where predator drones are operating with a map of sending countries for the migration, so-called migration crisis in Europe. And you'll see over the past five years, Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Somalia, those, those countries are on the top 10 year after year after year. It's not, there's a relationship, obviously, between one set of things and the other things. You know, in a way, individuals crossing national borders are asserting the same right that the international intelligence community is asserting, that is, to deny sovereignty, to reject the, the boundaries of borders, and to vote with their feet. That's very simply what's happening. It's a democratization of the transnational experience, in a way. Um, that, just to skip over a note about the fact that the U.S. isn't doing enough to resettle these refugees. It goes without saying. We did very poorly with the Iraq refugees who uh, fled to uh, Syria. Up to 2 million were in Syria. We've taken, I think, a total of 200,000 Iraqi refugees uh, since the mid-2000s. We've only taken 1,800 Syrian refugees in the four years of the uh, uh, Syrian war. Um, much more to be done. Point four. Um, thinking about the refugee crisis and migration, a cautionary tale and a hopeful tale. You know, we're sort of, we're, we're kind of insulated from the Iraqi or the, 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 the current refugee crisis just simply by geography, but there's a really interesting <laughs> historical parallel, which uh, Jean-Philippe mentioned at the beginning, which was the Central American immigration to the United States in the 1980s and 1990s, when uh, one a million and a half Salvadoran and Guatemalans came north, like 20% of the population of Salvador. Um, mostly overland, at great personal danger, many thousands died, um, to a country that was very much involved in the conflicts that set them in motion. You know, I went to, the, I, I started out as a writer, as a uh, reporter on the U.S.-Mexico border, and I would go to the bo border in 1991 when there still wasn't a fence, and you would ha see women in, tr you know, highland indigenous dress carrying their children um, and just walking across the border, from, coming from the places in the highlands of Guatemala that were the subject of the genocide that was being carried out by a government that the U.S. supported. Um, particular, uh, uh, politically, the U.S. response under Reagan was quite hostile because that was to, to admit that these were refugees, was to admit that our policy uh, was uh, responsible um, so that they denied them refugee status and uh, detained people in mass detention centers and forced many to do what they called voluntarily return. 
that sort of opened up spaces in the United States mind that were um, graphically sort of replicated in 1991 after the coup in Haiti sent thousands of people fleeing in boats that were interdicted, interdicted by the Coast Guard and held at Guantanamo um, and then returned home. And some of those cages, as you know, from that camp would ultimately be repurposed for Camp X-ray in Guantanamo. So it really kind of opened up a space legally for this idea that there's, you can create legal no man's lands where people will not be able to assert the rights that they would have if they reached US soil. More hopefully today that there are 3.2 million Central American immigrants in the United States that came during that time, those refugees and their descendants. From that, we have a legacy of activism for immigrant rights that includes a sanctuary movement that's still very active. And we have tens of thousands and millions of immigrant success stories, businesses, uh, people that are you know, thriving in communities. Um, and you think about, just again, to sort of flip the telescope around, that migration, which we think of in mass terms, is individual, every, it's a series of individual decisions that are aspirational. And as they look back at it now, they tell his, histories that are personal narratives. Um, many of them are very positive stories. Which brings me back finally to Mohamedou and his cellmate in Senegal. Um, and to my final, final point, just I think to underscore what everybody's been saying today, Pope Francis, when he spoke to Congress, said, if we want security, we must give security. It's so simple, it's so straightforward. But that means that's an individual thing. Security is an individual. It means that anyone anywhere should have the most basic sense that you and those you love will be safe, that your rights will be recognized, respected, and protected, and that you won't be treated arbitrarily. It means looking at where those rights reside, which is in individuals, looking them in the face. And it means insisting on the rights of all men. And when Jefferson wrote this, there wasn't yet a United States, so he meant everyone, and let's assume he meant women and children too. The rights of all men to life, liberty, and as the young Ivoirian asserted so buoyantly to Mohamed Uslahi in that Senegalese prison cell to the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> well now we're gonna open this up to a bit of a Q&A portion of our event, and that will include audience questions as well, though I have some of my own too. And, uh, and Jean-Philippe, a question for you that I probably should have asked before we started this. <laughs> but um, so just for everyone to be on the same page, you know, according to our program here, uh, primarily I'm, I'm meant to be speaking with Larry and Sally, but may everyone jump in if they have something to add or add a comment? Okay. Good to know. Um, a lot to cover today, but you know, there's a, an old maxim that kind of was ringing in my mind when people say, in times of war, the law falls silent. And sadly, we have seen many times throughout U.S. history that hold true. You can, you can go back to Lincoln uh, suspending habeas corpus. You can look at the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. And then, of course, the many, many examples that have been mentioned today uh, during this war on terror. But I guess one of the questions for me and Larry, perhaps you could take this one first, is when, when conflict, when war becomes ever present, as it has, as as it has now, because we are facing this threat of terrorism, which just seems to be uh, transnational uh, small cells that keep moving from one place to the other, and and a threat that is very hard to measure based on what the government tells us uh, as to whether or not it's something that is being defeated or not, then what is our relationship with the law, especially as Americans? How do, how do we see it today? If, if these are the times when exceptions have historically always been made, how do we make sure that it's not just one constant exception? I mean, that's a great question. I think, you know, historically, when we've made those exceptions, we've repented later. I mean, that's a, that's a really important point to make. Um, you know, we always say, oops, that was not the right way to go. I think we have abundant evidence now that many of our national security pro uh, um, initiatives and military initiatives have not achieved the goals that we said we were uh, seeking. I mean, it, it's impossible to say, for example, that the landscape in Afghanistan and Iraq and now Syria, it looks better than it did 10 years ago. 
15 years ago. So you know, it's hard even to argue from a pragmatic point of view that these are effective. People ask me all the time, what should the white, what, what's the right regime for interrogating and, and detaining you know, uh, terrorism suspects. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a policy person. I can tell you that the regime that Mohamedou recounts in Guantanamo Diary is the perfect lesson in how not to do it. Um, I think it's just, you know, I think it is, the, the very simple point is that the United States has maintained, and up until now still maintains, although it's greatly diminished, this aspirational presence in the world that's based on an articulation of a set of values um, that are human rights values um, and and civil rights values, and I think you know that is easily the most powerful tool that we have. And to you know to renounce the tool or to say that we have to you know sacrifice some of that tool in order to get security is um, a paradox. It's a false paradox. It's not true. Again, the evidence suggests that's not right. And the last point is simply, you know, we say that we're in a constant state of war, but for God's sake, you know. <coughs> Think about the parts of the world where people are coming from now. They are in a constant state of war. They are in a constant state of war. We talk about you know the threat of terrorism in New York City versus the threat of a, a, a bombing in you know in Baghdad. Come on, seriously, you know. And I think that you know it, it, yes, we, we feel insecure and we feel fearful, but we really have to modulate our sense of fear against the realities that most people in many parts of the world are living. I think one a concept that if I could get this, a concept that might be useful for thinking about this is the idea of the state of exception, and this is a, a status that is often a legal status that a country will move into the state of exception under conditions of emergency, sometimes called a state of emergency, often connected with war or sense of threat. And what a state of exception typically means is that the normal protections that individuals have can be set aside. And you can see that this happened in the post-2011, 9-11 moment in the US with the Patriot Act. And I think that this sense of continual crisis really feeds into the sense that we're now in a state of exception so we don't actually get the kinds of protections that we think we're normally entitled to. And it's, it's actually a very insidious concept because it enables states to take much greater control using kind of anxiety about security to have us surrender these kinds of rights. And a migrant crisis, a war, the kinds of situations that many countries that are sending migrants live in are places where these states of exception can easily be established and are, are put into place. So I think challenging that whole notion that this is a state of exception and emergency. Things need to be set aside. Is an important move to make. Um, on that note, though, right? Fear is an incredibly powerful tool, and it's something that, that certainly sways populations, and it's something that then allows for government abuse in many respects. And so, I think that if you look at uh, if you look at security not only as a justification for eroding people's rights, but also as a justification for rejecting people. Uh, you know, that's something that's being employed right now in not wanting to welcome Syrian refugees is because, well, ISIS might be among them, uh, is what we're hearing. Or I hate to bring Donald Trump into this, but you hear Donald Trump mention Mexican immigrants and it's they're, they're murderers and rapists, and that's why we don't want them coming across the border. And so I feel like then there's this twisted logic um, that that is put into it in saying that this policy of rejection and of, and of being closed-minded is really one that is based in concern for the community and safety for the community. So, uh, you know, so Sally, how do you how do you flip that on its head? How do you get people to to not allow their fears to be exploited in such a way? I, I, this is, gets me back to my point about where these fears. Can you hear me on this microphone? Where these fears turn out to be strongest, and they are typically strongest where the contact is least. Um, and the fear then can be mitigated by actual contact between people. And that's why policies that separate or that exclude or to keep immigrant populations from being able to merge with the whole are actually incredibly destructive. Um, it, it was interesting to me that that when Barney Frank wrote about the really rapid transition in attitude towards same-sex marriage and LGBT populations in the US in general, he pointed out that one of the things that happened was when people started to come out, it turned out that the people who were gay were actually your neighbors, your friends, your family members. And so the familiarity 
we did a lot to kind of rapidly eliminate discrimination. This may be an overly optimistic story, but anyway, this is Barney Frank's story. But we can see how the separation and the division actually builds on the fear. The irony is that immigration is a huge economic boost to the receiving country. What it means is that some other country has invested the resources in training, educating, feeding, raising these people to adulthood, and then the receiving country kind of gets that whole benefit, and the sending country loses all that investment in their children and young people uh, because the adult productive people are leaving. So it, it's sort of strange that this is viewed as such a negative experience, particularly in countries that are facing demographic declines and, and they don't have enough young people. You think they would be uh, welcoming. So why it becomes redefined as a threat instead of a benefit is, is a very important issue to ask. And I think it does have to do with unfamiliarity and separation and frankly, uh, state unwillingness to take a more positive stand and to do things to provide training and language and other kinds of incorporative gestures and movements and, and institutions. Um, I, I guess another issue that I, uh, that I wanted to bring up here too, if we, if we think about all that, and I hate to play, I hate to play the blame game, but if you look at some of the migrant crises that are occurring, if you especially want to look at what's happening in Syria, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, why there are refugees fleeing, you could point to the United States and their foreign policy, our foreign policy, um, and the way that it has been destabilizing in the region. You could potentially say the same thing for Central America uh, that is ravaged with, with conflict due to the drug war, and those are the primarily the asylum seekers that the United States is currently dealing with. And so, you know, Larry, at, at what point does the United States have to step up and take a larger role and take more responsibility and say this isn't an overseas problem, one that exists beyond our borders, because we are cognizant of our past actions? Now? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, it, it's an, that's a paradoxical thing about the United States, because in fact, we are a very welcoming country. Then you know the the number of refugee resettlements that happen in this country you know tower above other countries on earth. And um, you know we we have traditionally played a very positive role. And you know even you know after we got back past those first bumpy years of the Central American immigration, you know um, as I said you know that, that you know twenty percent of El Salvador's population was transferred to the United States and you know settled and have have built lives here. So. You know, I, I, but I think you know they, 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 they again ge geography is a problem with the Syria, the Syria and Iraqi refugees. You know, the United States only made a gesture to help Iraqi refugees in 2006 when it, it became especially dangerous for Iraqis who had been who were journalists working for newspapers that the United States had set up, or who who were educated in bilingual and were working as interpreters or translators for U.S. forces. They started to be targeted and killed. Um, and at that point, that, that made enough press that the United States in 2007 said, we're going to resettle 7,000 Iraqi refugees who had ties to United States forces. And that, you know, that sort of broke down the door. So it took us having some sense of real personal responsibility that there were individual people there who were in individual peril because they had individually helped us. That made it, that moved us over the line with Iraq. You know, I don't think that's the situation so much with Syria now. But I do think that there is, paradoxically, and this is kind of shocking, and I didn't realize this until recently. But it only came to light when they asked all of the pre Republican presidential candidates if they would do a do-over for Iraq, and only Jeb Bush said yes. And he said, "My bad, I misunderstood the question." And I was like, "Well, how come?" I these guys are trying to be more hawkish than the next, right? How come nobody on the Republican side says they would invade Iraq? It turns out that for the last four or five years, polling in the United States has shown that 75 to 80 percent of the American people know, admit privately that the Iraq war was a catastrophic mistake. We never talk about that publicly at all. But I do think that there is a there is a sense, you know, a, 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 an opening sense of responsibility that comes from the fact that, here's an interesting fact, 2.5 to 3 million Americans served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And almost all those men and women are home now. And they bring home with them a sense of personal 
responsibility for some individual people, a sense of the general chaos that affects the lives of people there. And so I think that you know um, Obama moved relatively quickly to say that he would move the ceiling up to 10,000 for Syrians for next year, and I think that number will go up. So I, I'm optimistic that the United States will make some moves, the right moves. Um, yeah, I'm going to break the order in our program just for a little bit here because our next speaker has to get going. And so let me please uh, introduce Jacqueline Baba. She is the FXB Director of Research and the Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you, and sorry for jumping in, but I um, have to catch a plane, so I, I, I will have to leave uh, promptly. So I, I guess I'll, I'll um, make a couple of comments um, which would have come right at the end, so they're not actually going to be conclusions, just sort of contributions to the discussion. But really what I wanted to say um, was uh, to build on the excellent points that have already been made, n nearly all of which I'm obviously in complete agreement with, and to suggest a way forward. And I'm going to suggest that we really need to have a dramatic paradigm change in the way we think about migration. Um, I think that, actually, I think, Larry, you highlighted this nicely. We have this paradox of sovereignty that on the one hand, as I think uh, you said, Sally, um, you know, it's sovereignty that leads states to jealously guard their own right to control their border. It's sovereignty that Hungary is playing on when it says we are a Christian country. It's sovereignty that drives the sense that each border now increasingly in Europe too is somehow sacrosanct. And yet on the other hand, we see that sovereignty is really exploded by a kind of neo-colonialism of might is right. So we see extraordinary rendition as a great example of that, but not just in the security sphere. Think of what's happening in the migration sphere too. The most powerful countries are outsourcing the responsibility to protect migrants. So whether it's the US paying Mexico to do its dirty work for it and keep the Central Americans out, many of you might have seen the large article by Isabella Fonseca in the, I think it was the New York Times cover magazine just a week or two ago. The US is using Mexico as a buffer state, just like Europe used Hungary and Morocco and the southern kind of ring around the kind of Schengen land, if you like, as buffer states. So you have on the one hand this sort of uh, sanctification of sovereignty, and the other hand actually a complete trampling on sovereignty because extraordinary rendition and the kind of, uh, you know, if you like, um, outsourcing of, uh, of burden rather than burden sharing is exactly the opposite of that. So I think that um, we really need to think again about how this regime works. And so I guess my second point is that the human rights framework that Sally mentioned and that is always invoked really was a response cumulatively, but nevertheless a response to the Holocaust and to fascism in Europe. Um, uh, clearly there was a long pre-existing tradition, I'm not denying that, but nevertheless the exact shape of what we have now is very much based on the notion of barbarity that can't reoccur, the potential for sovereign states to turn barbarous on their own people and so on. It's very much a thinking which is based on that way of conceiving of, uh, of humanitarian and human rights responsibility. And I think we now see that that framework just really no longer applies. In the migration field, for example, one of the points that comes up <coughs> again and again, which is fundamental to the way we think about our migration protection responsibilities, is this supposedly clear dichotomy between refugees who are deserving of protection because they're fleeing persecution and economic migrants sneaking in to get the benefits of our welfare state or to just have a better life as if that was somehow um, an illegitimate goal. And so we are lumbered with this 
false dichotomy between these two areas, whereas in fact what we're seeing is really, you might call it distress migration writ large, where of course there are multiple reasons like uh, all of us have for what we do. There's not one reason. You don't only flee because you're fleeing uh, the bombing that you know might happen on your house tomorrow. You're also fleeing because you want to... Uh, have money to support your children and you're also fleeing because you think you may be able to get a good education and you're also fleeing because you've seen films about the west which make you think it's a better place to live and you're also fleeing for etc etc so mixed migration distress migration is really how we need to think about this and we're hampered by the straitjacket of the refugee convention we're hampered by some of the very narrow notions that we very cynically apply to people who clearly are desperate. And we've done it before. There's nothing new. As you said, Larry, we did this with the Central Americans. Not even 1% of Salvadorians, Hondurans, or Guatemalans got asylum in the U.S. when it was clear that they were fleeing extraordinary brutality. So I guess my second point is we really need to question and have the confidence, I think, and the bravery to really question some of these principles that are guiding uh, the way we deal with, with distressed migration. My third point is closely related to that, which is that we always talk as if this is a sudden crisis. Just think back 18 months to the so-called surge of unaccompanied Central American miners last year you know, between 80 and 100,000, when in previous years it had been sort of somewhere between six and 10,000. President Obama called it a humanitarian crisis. It was referred to as a surge. There was a sense of panic. And now, fast forward to where we are now, and it's the same idea that we suddenly have this European refugee crisis. But actually, we are in a steady state mode of crisis. It's a different situation that we're now facing from the one that we are sort of led to believe we're dealing with. And why is that? What has changed? And I would say there's several things that have changed if you think about kind of the World War II situation. First of all, in the World War II context, the whole presumption was that people like us, white, middle-class, educated people like us, were fleeing barbarous governments. Today, what's happening is we have an increasingly unequal post-colonial world in which people are fleeing untenable circumstances where whole countries have 50, 60, 70 percent youth unemployment, where there's a steady state of conflict, where you can't really make a distinction between peace and war. Because actually, post-conflict and conflict bleed into each other, and you could have a long list of countries which fit into that picture. So to think that we're just dealing with a crisis, that we have to fix this crisis, we have to, a la Hungary, erect metal fencing between ourselves and Serbia or ourselves and Croatia or a la Mexico, US, erect, you know, kind of uh, heat sensors and a sort of warlike uh, apparatus at the border is to completely miss the real problem. And of course, the point's already been made quite rightly that all it does is really up the price and up the danger and up the mortality of the search for safety. So um, I just want to make one final point before I kind of look forward. So the final point is that, of course, and again, this is a point that's been very well made, I think, we're all much more interconnected. We're interconnected in the sense that many of the problems we're seeing are legacies of a colonial and post-colonial world in which inequality is growing as resource allocation is getting more and more unequal. But we're also more in interconnected because people see much more how other people live. I was just reading today that, you know, now, and I, I know this from my own work, that people plot out where they're going through Facebook because previous migrants or previous relatives will say, this is the way to travel. This is how you get from A to B. It's one world. It's one route. It's a continuum. We're no longer separated in kind of completely distinct silos. So I think we need to really think very differently about the crisis we're facing, and much more boldly, I would say. And I think this is beginning to happen in Europe, and I don't know if Niels agrees with me, but I, my sense of the European situation is that people are really thinking a bit more big picture. Not everybody, and there isn't consensus, but I think the urgency of really seeing that this is a game changer. I mean, there are going to be a million 
Syrian and probably Afghani and Iraqi refugees in Germany this year, a million new refugees. Germany, I think, has a population of 82 million. So imagine you have a room like this full of Germans. One in every 82 Germans is actually a Syrian. It's a game changer. It's a different world that we're looking at. This is not just a crisis which you're going to tap. It's going to be a new population. It's going to be a new diaspora, like the diasporas that we've seen in the 20th century. So how should we move forward? And I guess this is where I'm putting on my conclusion hat because I have to leave, <laughs> which, for which I apologize. Um, firstly, I think we need to really rethink this kind of distinction between the development world, development economics, and the human rights and humanitarian world. These silos really have to come together. We need to think about aid or investment or taking down trade barriers or all of the above as part and parcel of this discussion, as inequality grows. So the urge to improve your quality of life is going to grow. We need to think. And so when we're talking about human rights or talking about migration, we need to be looking at economics and we need to be looking at infrastructure. Just take America's backyard, if you like. Look at what's happening in, in Honduras and in El Salvador and in Guatemala. Just look at the circumstances, how dangerous life is there for kids with gangs. Gangs, of course, which are the product of American demand for drugs and American deportation of, of, of gang members and so on. This is all interconnected. So the first point looking forward is that I don't think we in the human rights world can any more separate ourselves from these big picture development kind of issues. Development, however we call it, has to come together with, with these kind of normative frameworks which on their own really don't deliver. Secondly, I think we need to think about what we mean by integration much more honestly. Um, and I think Sally's made the point very well that actually familiarity doesn't breed contempt. Familiarity breeds this outpouring of humanitarian, positive, generous sentiment that we have seen. I mean, just look at what's been happening in Europe. Apparently now, if you go to Germany, every single open space, every park, every fairground, every big community center has got beds in it. And people, tens of thousands of people are contributing on a daily basis. Just ordinary people, not human rights activists like us. Ordinary people are just this outpouring of a sense of a positive humanitarianism. That's what we've got to build on. And so my point there is that we need to think about how we as a movement counter the xenophobic movement, which is small. It's there, it's worrying, but it's much smaller, I think, than the majority view. And, you know, we've luckily now even got the Pope on our side, so, you know, there's lots to build on. Um, and we can really start developing and thinking concretely about how you develop solidarity, how you develop an investment in integration. And my small thought here is that we here in America um, need to really develop a new sister city or sanctuary movement like what happened in uh, in the States for the Central Americans in the 80s and 90s. So New York has already started it, but we need to be saying to the, to the Obama administration, it's pathetic, you've just added an extra 100,000. Turkey has 2 million Syrian refugees, so this is where I slightly not differ from you, but I think when you say America has this tradition of generosity and no one has accepted more people, well, actually, not really. I mean, look, one in four people in Lebanon is Syrian. And these are countries much less well equipped than we are. So we need to be saying to the administration, you know what? New York and Boston and Chicago and LA and San Francisco, we all want, we have mayors, we have city um, administrators, we have governors who are willing to allocate resources. We have people who are willing to take part in this. You know, whether you want to go as far as the Pope saying, you know, everybody should make a bed available or a room available in the house. But I think as citizens, you know, there is really scope actually for making a difference. I really do. I don't think automatically the, the, the ceiling for resettlement will increase unless there is a strong show of political will and political um, support for this. And I think that has to come bottom up. So I guess my final plea really is that we should all be thinking about this. This is not a problem out there. This is a problem that we're all intimately connected with. And, you know, there but for the grace of God, of course, go each of us. So I would just encourage all of us to think how we can, you know, use 
our universities or our advocacy organizations or our, our, our religious um, um, entities or whatever we, we belong to, to, to put pressure on politicians to actually really make some small contribution. It's not going to be an enormous one, but it should be a significant one. Thank you. I'm sorry for going on. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, well, unfortunately, we are out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. But I think that we've certainly covered a, a wide range of topics tonight and discussed both the very dire circumstances at times and also the more hopeful elements uh, and, and just shown that there needs to be some some organization and some structure behind it. And so I just want to thank uh, Jean-Philippe and Nils and Susan and Sally and Larry and of course, Jacqueline and uh, and Stefano, who, as we said before, could not be here tonight. But thank you all very much for joining us. <laughs>